Um, so yeah, first of all, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good night, everyone. <laughs> um, welcome to this world, a week's law science event. I'm Daniel Hipke, a JSD candidate from Cornell Law School, and I will be the moderator for the session. Before introducing today's speaker, Shivali Munchi, let me briefly introduce the Law Science Project. Um, we are an academic initiative coordinated by a group of JSD candidates who share the same belief in legal methodologies. Law, the study of law is often understood as a, as a discipline distinct from hard science, traditionally consisting of doctrinal analysis and normative questions. And through this uh, series of, of interdisciplinary talks, we aim to show that legal research can be improved and benefit from scientific methodologies. Um, if you want to learn more about the Law Science Project, please visit our website and join our email list. Um, one of the other coordinators will drop the links in the chat. Also, I want to bring your attention to the ongoing call uh, partnered with the Weiner Young Scholars Committee. Um, it is directed to doctoral candidates in different disciplines um, that will receive back from senior scholars. So again, if you're interested, uh, in having more information, please subscribe to the project. To continue today's session, I want to briefly introduce our uh, coordinators first. There's uh, Simon Sun. He's an SJD at Indiana University Morrow School of Law, and he is the co-founder of this initiative. Um, then we have Vanessa Villanueva, a JSD candidate from the University of Illinois College of Law, and Patrick uh, Ching, uh, Chung Chua Huang, who is a JSD candidate from the law school at the University of Chicago. We also have representatives um, at, at other law schools, um, uh, such as the uh, JSD JSP program from the University of California at Berkeley and the University of Virginia. If you're interested in getting involved, we are currently looking for new uh, representatives, so you will find a link for that in the chat as well. So now um, let me finally turn to today's talk, which I'm very excited about. Um, so we are very honored to have as our opening speaker for a series on interdisciplinary approaches to comparative legal studies, Shirali Manchi, professor of law at Georgetown Law. She has earned a JD from Harvard Law School, a PhD in literature from Columbia University, has been a Perkins LAPA fellow at Princeton University, and as I said, is now professor at Georgetown. She works on a diverse range of topics such as property law, immigration law, and critical legal theory. Uh, and additionally, her contributions to comparative law that she, among others, published in the American Journal of Comparative Law are, I believe, amongst the most fascinating novel methodological intervention in the fields in the last decade. And therefore, I'm very excited for a talk today on, on a decolonial comparative law. We will have time for Q&A later, so please prepare your questions. The event will be recorded and uploaded to, to the YouTube channel, so you can either raise your hand or write down your questions in the chat box, and I will read them out to you. Okay, great. So without further ado, uh, the floor is yours, uh, Shirali. Okay, well, thank you for that very generous introduction. I didn't know people read <laughs> these things, but I'm grateful. I'm grateful for your um, for your introduction. So thank you to Daniel and the other organizers of the series. It really looks fantastic. I don't I didn't realize that possibly I could have joined um, before now, but it looks it looks great. So so congratulations. Uh, and then I'm very grateful to have this opportunity to talk about methodology, which perhaps uh, does not occasion as much reflection as as it should within legal scholarship. Um, and let me just, before sort of jumping into my talk, say a little bit about my myself. So my own interest in thinking about methods is informed by my own interdisciplinary training, which you mentioned before becoming a law professor. I had completed a PhD um, at a program at Columbia that was called English and Comparative Literature, right? So it was English and Comparative Literature with a focus in post-colonial and ethnic studies. Um, so I don't necessarily think of myself as doing comparative law in any conventional sense. All of my teaching and writing has been informed by an expansive form of comparative thought, which I really kind of got in comparative literature, right, which is part of the focus of an article that I wrote a few years ago called Comparative Law and Decolonizing Critique, um, and that essay is the focus of, of my remarks today. Uh, so drawing on my study of comparative literature, especially literary theory, ethnic studies, post-colonial studies, I argued in that paper that an expansive form of comparative law may have a critical role to play in decolonizing and democratizing legal thought. Comparative law, I think, has a role to play in correcting legal scholarship 
uh, in general, making it more responsive to some of the urgencies of our time, global inequality, unprecedented homelessness in the world in the form of a refugee crisis, looming ca uh, climate catastrophe, all of which require a transnational approach. But in the past decade or so, the dawning realization of the essential instability of our contemporary global order has precipitated not a radical reimagining of collective responsibility, but resurgent forms of nationalism and authoritarianism. And so for the next uh, 20 minutes, what I'd like to do is first spend some time diagnosing a set of problems with comparative law and legal thought in general, uh, and then second, spend some time thinking about how a decolonial comparative law might address those problems, right? And I'll do this by saying a little bit about comparative literature, how comparative literature remade itself in the 20th century, really in the wake of radical movements in the 1960s and 1970s, and then I'll finally turn to offering a few discrete lessons that I have drawn from, from my own study and engagement in, comparative, uh, in that other comparative discipline. And I, I, my intention is really to do this in a way that opens up conversation. So I'd love to think to, with you, you know, about your own scholarly practices and your own scholarly uh, ambitions. Okay, so first let me say a little bit about a problem. So a few years ago in the American Journal of Comparative Law, uh, the journal devoted a special issue to an essay by Pierre Legrand, uh, anguishing that comparative law was in crisis. So in his critical assessment of the state of the field, he argued that comparative law had become mired in a solipsistic, outmoded style of positivism, one characterized by a narrowed focus on authorized texts and a committed indifference to almost everything else. So according to this, reigning orthodoxy, as he put it, the comparative study of law should remain, quote, squarely set on the rules on what has been posited by uh, authorized officials as what the law is, and these rules in turn should be represented in as scientific a manner as possible. The understanding of the discipline, perhaps informed by a European civil law tradition and maybe some of the conventions of European legal education, um, had encouraged comparative scholar, law scholars to produce dutifully descriptive accounts of cases and statutes supposedly uncontaminated by, as he put it, political commitment or personal investment, uncluttered by references to history or culture, free of editorialization, critical or otherwise. So in Legrand's account, the task assumed by the comparative law scholar was one of arranging the law in, a form of or, in the form of an orderly, coherent, systematic representation of the different rules in force, largely in the service of the state, right? So in this tradition, the role of the comparative law scholar is to rationalize an area of law and implicitly carry the ideological burden of preserving a certain image of law, again, as orderly, imp impartial, perfectible. So Legrand is appropriately skeptical of the positivist pretensions to scientific, scientific objectivity, uh, arguing that positivism can only fulfill its claims to objectivity by denaturing its object, that is, by cleaning it uh, of its essential ambiguity, indeterminacy, and inconsistency. Positives Positivists, he argue, invest their own legal, their own science of legal reasoning with a transcendental purity and disinterestedness, while effacing the contests and con contingencies that have allowed re legal reasoning to proceed as a self-authorizing force. Positivists imagine that law, or what the law is, might be neatly isolated for study. And here again, uh, positive le positivist legal discourse maintains its conceptual clarity you know, isolates its object, again, only by suppressing historical contingencies, cultural contaminations, and so on. So finally, for Legrand, the most concerning feature of positivism in legal discourse is that it maintains its authority by excluding challenge, just as a disciplinary matter. So it safeguards its claim, claims to reason, coherence, and neutrality by denying and devaluing certain forms of inquiry, particularly those that are most disruptive of the law's internal or legal discourse's internal logic and order. And there is, of course, a politics to policing the boundaries of a discipline, its objects of study, its tools of analysis. And we should recognize that positivism in legal discourse, like other forms of methodological certainty, tend uncomfortably towards a kind of authoritarianism, showing more concern for governing authority, preserving <laughs> governing forms of authority than with the collectivities that are governed by authority. So to redeem the, compar to redeem the comparative study of law, Legrand argues that comparativists should muddy the pristine waters of the, the positivist mainstream by engaging in two kinds of dredging. One is enculturation uh, and the other is interpretation. <laughs> 
So enculturation, or what we might just call contextualization, right, returns the legal object to, its, to the world of its emergence or generation, restoring uh, to it its essential unruliness, opening it to reinterpretation, resignification, and then renewed judgment, right? Opening law to a more open-ended act a more open-ended practice of interpretation, uh, you know, the second the second call uh, is critical for disabusing us of the notion that the legal scientist can study his object from a position of perfect remove or sublime indifference. It's critical for unraveling the Cartesian fallacy, which holds the knower apart from the known world. And cultured interpretation forces the legal scholar to acknowledge the ways in which his own parochialism, the confinements of language, culture, experience, structure, and ultimately limit his own knowing. So the epistemic enclosure that Legrand identifies as a deficiency in comparative law, I think might be recognized as a deficiency in legal scholarship in general. Uh, and his call for a more rigorous contextualization and more creative practice of interpretation, I think, are important correctives, again, not just for comparative law, but legal scholarship in general. But where Legrand limits his critique of legal discourse to a critique of disciplinary or epistemic enclosure, I am perhaps a little bit more interested in thinking about the political stakes of that epistemic enclosure. In other words, the problem with legal scholarship, in my view, is not simply that it sanctions poor intellectual habits or knowledge conventions. Instead, it's these habits and conventions sustain a legal violence, and namely law's complicity with ongoing forms of colonial capitalism and racialized dispossession. So I think a problem with a great deal of legal thought and legal scholarship and teaching is that um, it remains inadequate to understanding how the colonial past has shaped the crises that define our present, uh, in turn foreclosing avenues of redress and our capacity to imagine alternative futures. And so the hope for comparative legal scholarship is that it might recast itself as the guardian of alternative futures, other worlds, including worlds to come. Okay, so having one account of the problem with comparative law, you know, a question that naturally follows them is why invest any faith in the notion that comparative law might be the one to rehabilitate um, legal thought. And, you know, I approach that question in two ways. One is by recognizing that um, what has always been the core value of comparative, any comparative approach to legal study, and that is by inclining ourselves towards the the, the foreign and unfamiliar, comparativism becomes a way of suspending a form of self-certainty by provisionalizing our most sacred institutions, by disrupting our usual intellectual routines. Comparativism becomes a practice and a discipline for repositioning oneself in the world. And I really mean that there is a kind of like ethical posture in, in comparativism, right? In this inclination towards otherness. And my own faith in comparative law actually has less to do with my reading of comparative law than my training in comparative literature, as I mentioned. Um, and so, you know, part of what I want to do now is um, is explain how <laughs> explain say a little bit about uh, you know how my kind of faith and comparativism is informed by the extraordinary career of comparative literature in the in the American university. So some 60 years ago, Renee Wellick, a scholar of comparative literature, issued a set of complaints about the state of the discipline, complaints that resonate with Legrand's complaints about the excessive positivism now afflicting comparative law uh, and perhaps comparative uh, and legal scholarship in general. So Wellick suggested that comparative law, so anxious about its own methodological rigor, had become a silly kind of scientism, attempting to turn the reading of literature into a kind of natural science with a study of origins, causal antecedents. It had become sort of bogged down by accumulating facts about uh, authors' reading habits, national contacts, influence tracking. And in this way, comparative literature had regressed into a bizarre form of cultural accounting, a bookkeeping of national credits and debts. So for Wellick, positivism was one problem, uh, with comparative literature, uh, and then re reifying national differences was another, right? So he said, you know, whatever value practices like observation, measurement, comparison may have in the natural sciences, it really was out of place in the study of literature and culture. And so what Wellick proposed was that the discipline of comparative literature could simply abandon the self-imposed pressure to compare, right? No need to compare. <laughs> so comparative literature scholars were surely free to talk about literature of diverse origin, right? But he said they were also free to talk about literature in general, 
or for that matter, history, or for that matter, philosophy from any position without any pretense to scientific object objectivity, right? So Wellick's interve intervention, very well received, did not exactly rid comparative literature of its methodological anxieties or preoccupations. And in fact, almost immediately after this intervention in the 1960s, the kind of factual positivism that well Wellick was, was co concerned with was superseded by new forms of critical thinking in the form of post-structuralism, deconstruction, feminism, psychoanalysis, post-colonialism, new historicism. And these you know, new critical movements were themselves shaped by uh, radical movements against empire, racism, patriarchy, authoritarianism, capitalism, and so on. So with the introduction of, of critical theory, comparative literature took a fundamental turn away from the traditional study of natural, national cultures to undertake a more thoroughgoing in investigation into the production of knowledge itself, right? The intellectual conventions, the material conditions of knowledge production itself. And so through its engagement with critical theories since 1960s, comparative literature transformed in itself into one of the most compelling sites, I think, of intellectual production in the university, generating, generating powerful tools for challenging previously unassailable conventions, enabling scholars across the humanities and social scientists, so, social sciences to interrogate the logocentric, ethnocentric, gendered biases that have sustained Western thought uh, since the Enlightenment. It was really a kind of challenge to authorized forms of knowledge production, right? So it's because of its openness to self-reflexivity, disciplinary disobedience, that um, comparative literature had become an important refuge to scholars working at odds with their own disciplines, especially historic, uh, philosophers, lots of philosophers. Um, and it was within the field of comparative literature that post-colonial and queer theory found most powerful articulation. And I think it's fair to say that the practice of questioning received forms of authority has transformed the self-understanding of many disciplines, right, from history and anthropology, you know, even to some corners of harder sciences, right, like biology. So one question, perhaps, genuine, genuine question I have still to sort of think about is why was legal education during the like, last half of the 20th century um, relatively insulated from, from uh, you know, the, the, the impact that, that this kind of critical theory had on so many other disciplines, right? Radically transforming anthropology, for instance, right? Um, that's an aside. Okay, so having sort of said a little bit about about comparative literature and why I think sort of comparative literature lends itself as a kind of model. I want to now just offer a sketch of a few discrete lesson, lessons from comparative literature that have informed my own legal scholarship and teaching, and that I think might inform comparative law, again, imagining that comparative law has a vital role to play in addressing an entrenched Eurocentrism in legal discourse while providing hospitable ground for a range of critical and interdisciplinary projects especially those that challenge legal discourse by um, forcing it to confront its constitutive exclusions, its entanglements with race and empire. Okay, so a first lesson is to displace the nation state frame that organizes most legal discourse and scholarship. So again, legal comparative scholarship has always been invested in developing an understanding of one's own national particularity by thinking across national cultures. Um, but as plenty of scholars point out, there's always the risk that in stabilizing national comparators, we risk reifying and essentializing national cultures, exaggerating differences between cultural contexts. So rather than disrupt a methodological nationalism, comparative scholarship runs the risk of reinscribing right, a methodological nationalism. And in my own thinking and writing about immigration law, I've become interested in bringing the nation state itself, right, the nation state form itself within the frame of analysis. So when scholars and lawmakers um, ask questions like who should be allowed to cross borders, under what circumstances, and so on, they often leave unexamined the historical formation of the national border itself. Right? National borders are simply taken for granted as a backdrop against which a normative debate unfolds. But as we know, or as we should know, right, the nation state form is itself a relatively recent historical formation, um, as is the contemporary border regime within which nation states claim an exclusive authority over human movement. 
The nation state and the nation state system were developed largely to manage crises produced by world war, the collapse of European empire states, and the closing of new world settler frontiers. And part of what I've argued is it's the experience of Asian exclusion that really sort of gives rise to a new articulation of national borders in the white settler colonial context. Um, in some of my writing about the border politics in the United States, I've sought to defamiliarize the national border by resituating the United States within a right, widened framework of settler colonialism, the collapse of empires, but you know, more importantly, the United States relationship to an indigenous continent. Uh, and the, for me, the colonial and imperial dimensions of the southern border first came into view through my study of Indian immigrants to the US in the early 20th century. So like Chinese and Japanese immigrants before them, Indians found themselves subject to exclusion. But again, the story of Asian exclusion is, is, has to be understood as a transnational story, right? The story of um, Asian exclusion is not a US story. May Nye has written a book about the Chinese question. It's a global question, right? So part of the, you know, the task is to sort of resituate um, these, these histories within broader histories of settler colonialism, empire states. Um, Okay, and when we bring the nation state itself into the frame of analysis, then we, be, we can shift the kinds of normative questions we ask, right? We can shift the normative kinds of normative questions that we ask, for instance, of immigration law, right? So rather than continuously address ourselves to abstract formulations of which foreigners should we admit to a country, the more relevant question for me is how does a barely perceptible taken for granted border nationalism obscure and inure us to the violence of a contemporary form of empire through which we're living, through which will become a primary tool for managing the crisis of climate migration and so on, right? How do we sort of make visible political questions that are obscured by a nation state frame? Okay, a second and related insight drawn from comparative literature is to shift methodological emphasis from comparison to relation. Right. So those of us who are interested in questions about race often turn to comparative methods to explore and unearth the contingency of contemporary racial forms. So we might distinguish the nation-centered models that have that have. Um, so we might distinguish the nation-centered models of comparison uh, that have uh, taken shape within academic departments, right? Comparative literature, comparative law, from another comparative tradition, right? Um, created by political thinkers who have compared their experience of racialized subordination to those of others. So this is a tradition that we might include in which we, we might include Hannah Arendt, Gandhi, Martin Luther King. Um, consider also <laughs> some of the solidarity movements taking shape in the United States in our contemporary moment, right? Aligning black and indigenous activists in movements against violent policing, environmental deg degradation, other forms of social abandonment. So consider, for instance, a demonstration led by survivors of Japanese internment against the, the detention of immigrant families and children. So in 2019, soon after Trump announced his plans to open a child detention center in a military base in Oklahoma, Japanese survivors of incarceration were joined by several other activist groups, Black, Indigenous, Jewish, and immigrant, each compelled by their own community's experience of family separation and detention. Uh, this particular uh, military base called Fort Sill in Oklahoma had been opened as a military base uh, in 1869 during the Indian Wars. In 1909, it was used to incarcerate uh, Apache resisting removal. And then during the Second World War, it was repurposed to incarcerate uh, Japanese Americans. So this sort of demonstration, bringing various groups together, confronts the settler nation with its constitutive exclusions. And at the same time, rather than simply reinscribing discrete forms of racialized difference, you know, Japanese, Latinx, and so on, this sort of demonstration shores up common grievance among people subject not simply to racialized exclusion or subordination, but the constitutive violence of the settler colonial project, um, which continuously produces differences, right? Continuously produces differences for management. So by identifying this violence as constitutive and continuous, this coalition of activists eschews the liberal um, politics of minority appeal for inclusion within you know, a, a nation state, and instead rehearses a form of collectivity necessary to imagining a post-colonial future, again, outside of um, a politics of liberal inclusion. <clears throat> 
as David Theo Goldberg has written, what a relational account adds is not just the historical legacy, it enables us to see how the colonial shaped the contemporary, planted racism roots and racism's roots in place, designed its social conditions and cemented its structural arrangements. This in turn, I want to argue, allows us to imagine our way beyond contemporary, the contemporary impasse and exhaustion of colonial capitalism managed by the liberal state. Finally, a third methodological turn that comparative law might borrow from comparative literature is a turn away from official authorized state discourse towards the discourse of the minor. So in some of my writing, I propose that comparative legal scholarship might unsettle and entrench nationalism in legal discourse by promoting study not just of foreignness that one discovers beyond national borders, but the foreignness that lies within a nation's borders. And so what I describe as a minor comparativism shares with comparative law scholarship a commitment to challenging and ex uh, expanding the understanding of one's own legal culture by embracing a foreign perspective. But a minor comparativism departs from a more traditional scholarship but that doesn't, in that it doesn't compare the legal culture of one state with another. Instead, it sets the official image of a legal culture, one authorized by the nation state, against the reflection produced by its minor, minoritized subjects. So again, in some of my own thinking and writing about immigration law in the United States, I've sought to challenge the self-image of the United States that sort of governs a lot of legal discourse, and that is a self-image of the nation, the United States as a nation of immigrants, one committed to a dream or a promise of universal inclusion. And I challenge this by engaging the counter archive of minor figures. <laughs> so James Baldwin claimed, if one really wishes to know how justice is administered in a country, one does not question the policemen, the lawyers, the judges, or the protected members of the middle class. One goes to the unprotected, those precisely who need the law's protection most, and listens to their testimony. Knowledge about law and its effects, Baldwin suggests, may appear more fully in the counter archive of minority discourse than in the legal text, the authorized legal text. And in my own research, I attempt to challenge law's account of itself, for instance, by engaging the writing of racialized migrants subject to exclusion or denaturalization in the early 20th century. Um, but we don't need to limit ourselves to writing, for instance, to recognize that the unauthorized border crosser is engaged in a form of meaning making. Consider, for instance, the migrant caravan that made its way up the continent in 2018. So this sort of mass demonstration is more than what the legal, you know, the, the law sort of says it is, right? Um, it's more than a kind of like illegal, <laughs> illegal movement, right? It's also a form of political discourse. This embodied action calls into question the representativeness of our democratic institutions, confronting them with an alternative expression of popular will, self-determination, and dissent. The migrant caravan challenges the American settler empire by confronting it again with its constitutive exclusions, the inevitable effects of the United States short-sighted military and economic aggressions, the fact that the southern border remains a colonial border, essentially walling a settler polity from a native surrounds. The philosopher Jacques Rancière has also refuge to English departments, um, has, has uh, described the real, has described real democratic practice, which he distinguishes from sanctioned um, or police democratic practice, right? He says real democratic practice is the inscription of the part of those who have no part, right? So the unauthorized is the part who has no part in the American polity, or we might, you know, as we might say, the self-authorized, right, is the part that has no part. So you know, a Mayan migrant who crosses the border without authorization may never hold the status of citizen. She may never, um, she may be denied fundamental rights and formal recognition, but with her self-authorized arrival, she challenges those illusions to insist that she is still a part of our political community all the same. Okay, minor, that's, that's the figure of the minor. So just to conclude, <laughs> colonialism has always stimulated comparisons, so has resistance to colonialism and its racist legacies. And for this reason, I've tried to advance a vision in which a creative, expansive, and interdisciplinary comparative law might play, again, an essential role in decolonizing legal thought and allow us to imagine um, alternatives to our colonial presence. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Professor, uh, for this for this talk and this presentation. Um,
we have we have now entered the Q and A session. Um, mm -hmm. We have an audience of international students. I'm sure uh, there will be a lot of questions. Again, this event will be recorded and uploaded, so you can either raise your hand or write down your question in the chat box, and I will read them out for you. Uh, I will try to keep the queue and might throw myself on there at one point. Mm -hmm. uh, and we start with Simon. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Amanshi, for uh, your presentation. I um, I was I got my bachelor's degree in Taiwan, and um, one thing that I think a de facto training for a legal scholar is to do a comparative uh, legal research. So I often think about the uh, influence uh, between Japanese literature, uh, where my grandfather was also a legal scholar. He was he was under colonization, and that really influenced his legal thought, and that influenced a whole generation. Um, of legal scholars um, in Taiwan. Um, my, my question draws on a, a bigger picture uh, within within your your thought here, which is, do you think there is any meaningful difference where, like in the United States, um, there is the, this idea of inviting diversity, there's like different racial groups versus countries that has been colonizing other countries versus country that has been colonized? And how do these three, con three kind of broad groups can, can draw experience or can draw knowledge from your roadmap uh, that, that can conduct a more, um, a better uh, comparative uh, legal work. Thank you. You mean, are you asking, I suppose, whether we need to sort of keep track of important differences between, um, for instance, people who, uh, you know, enter a sphere of US diversity as colonizers or descendants of yes. colonizers. And yeah, so I think, you know, here is for me part of what's at stake in, in um, turning maybe away from forms of racial identity in this moment, okay? In this moment to thinking about historical formations like colonialism, right? So a movement away from thinking in terms of identity categories to historical processes and historical formations is, um, you know, the, like the racial form or the sort of like production of racialized subjects is itself also like part of a history of colonialism and liberal management in the United States. And it's been sort of exported and adopted in different places and in different ways. And certainly in the United States, when we think about, for instance, like these debates about affirmative action, Asian American affirmative action, um, you know, the differences between people become dehistoricized, right, and flattened in ways that can um, reproduce and amplify existing forms of material inequality, right. And I think like in this moment, we have to be vigilant about the way in which a you know, a politics of, of diversity and formal equality can be sort of wielded to continue to reproduce what we might recognize as, um, you know, the asymmetries produced by colonial capitalism. And again, I think thinking about the figure of the Asian American model minority is one that opens that up for us, right? Um, but I don't know if that's exactly an answer to the question that you were, you were raising. I think there's another way in which and some of the, the work that I've been doing, thinking about the southern border, um, you know, increasingly the people who are crossing the southern border, who, you know, Trump has made a boogeyman out of, they're indigenous people, right? They're people who are indigenous to an undivided continent. But that particularity is often effaced within a kind of discourse that recognizes racial difference and maybe national difference. But the Guatemalans and Hondurans that are crossing the border in the United States are not conquistadors. <laughs> They're not descended from European settlers. They're overwhelmingly indigenous people, right? And I think sometimes recognizing that, and I think I recognize that by sort of, again, shifting away from a kind of framework of racial difference, difference of national culture, to sort of thinking about long processes of settler colonization, Right, that then that particularity come comes into view, you know. Uh, okay, so um, I think I, then I will follow. Um, so my my question is is based um, on on your reference to Le Grand. Um, so there's a way to read Le Grand, um, maybe less so in the two James's paper, which mm -hmm. I think you're referencing, right? That's mm -hmm. more in the his work on negative comparative law. 
so there's a way to reach him which would suggest that it is impossible to ever truly grasp the national distinctiveness or national difference as a national outsider. Mm -hmm. Seems to be something he, he in, in, in my view, like seems to, uh, as I understand him, seems to be very uh, concerned with. So an, an, a non-French person will never truly, truly mm -hmm. you know, understand or read the French system. Mm -hmm. And I think um, that reading has some problems such as who is ever truly a, a, a national insider in the first place. And one way I understand your account is actually problematizing this reading is by you pointing out that uh, who do we normally not consider a legal insider, but how much can we learn about the law and the workings of the law and the legal system by, by taking their perspective and studying their perspective? Mm -hmm. So you, you quoted this great uh, James Baldwin quote. Mm -hmm. um, but, but of course, Le Grand's criticism uh, can apply to this change of perspective as well. Mm -hmm. So the question then would be, can someone who does not share the lived experience of those new formerly uh, not studied perspectives, uh, can someone like this really study what the law is to, to these perspectives? Mm -hmm. um, so um, I know that different scholars have drawn different conclusions from there, and I just would be interested in your, I'm sure you thought about this question, so what, what are your thoughts about this? How are you attacking this? Or how uh, do you think we all should think about this? Yeah, I mean, I think I might not have an answer that fully attends to the nuances of your question, but I think that Le Grand is maybe reproducing a kind of solipsism found in a lot of like critical theory, right? That becomes in a way sort of formally concerned with these questions about self and otherness, right? Um, in, in a kind of abstraction, right? So I, I take seriously these post-colonial scholars who observe that, you know, this philosophical tradition that's concerned with otherness right? It's always like an other that is an other to self. <laughs> and in that sense, another form of self. And, you know, it becomes a little bit sort of solipsistic, right? Um, and not, not then really interested in the other, you know, the other, the otherness, the various forms of otherness that make Frenchness, for instance, right? It's easy to kind of, easy to call it out among, <laughs> you know, in Frenchness. Um, but, but I think, so that's it. So I think like, I guess part of what I was I'm saying politely, trying to say politely about Le Grand is that, um, you know, there is, he's sort of stuck in a kind of intrinsic critique concerned with the perfectibility of a discipline. And I, at some point, I think that there's like diminished returns in that. And what I'm interested in is sort of thinking about the extrinsic conditions that shape the stakes of these these intellectual um, practices. Is that, I, I don't know if that, does that answer? That's a great answer, thank you. <laughs> uh, I might have to follow up, but uh, first, yeah. Martha. Yes, hello. Um, I uh, have a question about um, legal systems using other uh, laws from other countries. I don't know if that's part of your interest, but uh, it is, I'm speaking from the perspective of a Canadian legal scholar. So mm -hmm. in Canada, our Canadian system has a tradition of calling on other legal systems um, and uh, using that other legal system to uh, interpret or analyze or perfect or improve or, you know, render decision. Um, and uh, when I studied, I did my uh, master's in the United States at Harvard too, and uh, I found that there was a complete absence of other systems in especially constitutional law, which is my interest. So I wondered if you had a comment on that, um, that it, it itself uh, is a reflection on the American legal system or, you know, what, uh, so I just wanted to um, suscitate a, a commentary on that, uh, that phenomenon. Yeah, I mean, I think there is a huge parochialism, you know, kind of, uh, shaping American legal discourse. I mean, you know, I, I don't know how to put this, but I've never been in a setting that's less interested in other cultures. I mean, you know, there's no part of any kind of like, no part of the university I think is less interested in, in other cultures. And then I think some of the conventions of legal scholarship is also always to kind of like turn back in, right? Turn back into, 
for instance, a property law paper returns to the tools of property law to sort of address its own problems. And there's an impatience with critique. I mean, I think this is a question that I kind of have and, and maybe, I don't know, maybe, maybe, um, track, you know, and actually in Canadian scholarship, I do see a lot more uh, awareness about, you know, um, First Nations people and the colonial status of, of Canada than you see in legal scholarship in the United States. Um, but I think, you know, there was like a high moment of critical theory in legal scholarship and then like a high moment of critical race theory, you know, in, in legal scholarship, and then a turn away and a disavowal of critique, right? And then I think like what's at stake in that is a kind of like reinvestment of faith within a, an American political tradition, right? And a kind of like imagining that an American political tradition has all of the resources that we need all the tools that we need to solve our problems. Um, but in my own teaching on property law, for instance, I think like increasingly I, I introduce students to the South African constitution, which contemplates a radical redistribution of property. It's unimaginable only because it's to make something imaginable that's unimaginable within our legal system, right? And then, you know, there are like these, you know, Latin American countries that recognize that lakes might have rights, right? Or that, Mother Earth might have rights. Again, totally unimaginable within our legal system. But don't we need to rehearse ideas like this to sort of address um, the things that students are concerned with in this moment, you know, rather than continuously kind of entrench a certain a habit of like, you know, like a habit of subtraction is Lebron's word, right? But thank you. Um, so, okay, I, I will follow up again on this. Um, uh, just, um, I think it would be, would be interesting for, for a lot of us, because there, are, I think there are a, a lot of international students who are doing comparative law, right? Mm -hmm. And just very concretely, I think it would be interested if we change basically the, the material that we study. I think you want to push us away from the kind of typical comparative work, which is kind of studying dry the text of the law stuff. Um, and I know that you did some of this work, so I would just be interested if you could maybe give some examples of what kind of other sources um, might mm. be worth studying. Well, maybe, I don't know if the others among you have examples of, of material that you think of turning to in your own, in your own projects, non-legal material that you turn to. I mean, I can, yeah, go ahead, speak for myself, but I'm, I'm also interested, yeah. Yeah, well, what I'm doing is uh, I'm using history um, as a basis for law. So it's, of course, non-legal. And um, because of the Dicean model that the Canadian system is based on, and especially in constitutional law, um, we don't have history. Um, it used to be that uh, constitutional law actually didn't even exist. It was just constitutional, constitutional history. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Dicey got rid of the history part, so it uh, became law. And um, so I'm, um, you know, using as a source history. Uh, so it is um, definitely uh, non-legal to um, advance my thesis. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Others? Yeah, there's, there's also um, a question in the chat, uh -huh. uh, which I think are actually two questions by Caesar. He says, wonderful presentation, two questions. Mm -hmm. First, regarding the third element of the methodology, how should we construct the role of the comparativist as a researcher to avoid reproducing exploitative and extractive research practices, particularly mm -hmm. when we are not part of the minor or subaltern group? Should this be done by, for example, collaborative re approaches that turn research participants into co-researchers? Mm -hmm. And the second question, which I think is unrelated, do you see the object of comparative law closer to the humanities or the social science? And how would that impact the methodological alternatives you proposed and the relation of comparative law to post-colonial thought? Mm -hmm. What fancy questions. Um, I think that's, I mean, there's just a nice impulse in the question, right? To sort of think about how to sort of engage these other forms of authorship without appropriating. I think there is always a risk there. Um, uh, hmm. 
And I don't know that I have a clear answer about it, except to sort of be vigilant, right? And I think like, to me, the point of comparative law is that we are always self-reflexive or comparativism, right? Or is that we're always sort of self-reflexive about our methodologies. So for instance, like now I'm thinking about a paper about what's at stake in the memorialization of certain histories of Asian exclusion in the United States, right? And part of what I'm interested in is like really the non-identity between Indians who are excluded, these radical Indians who are excluded in the, in the 20s, the, the non-identity between those people and the um, really well-educated tech workers that are the primary beneficiaries now of the H-1B visa system in the US, right? And I think we just have to then write an essay, <laughs> you know, I don't, so it's like thinking about how we don't appropriate, this is a little different, but like, how we don't over-identify with and appropriate um, the ugly histories of others, right? Which are not exactly the history of contemporary Asian Americans, right? Um, but I think that's, you know, the answer is, the answer is I think to sort of always sort of put it on the surface. I don't know, to sort of think about your, your choices and, and, and um, sort of put it on the surface. And then, with respect to like comparative law, humanities and social sciences, I mean, I certainly kind of come from the humanities and am invested in a humanistic tradition of interpretation. And I'll say like one thing that I always return to that's really interesting, you know, one thing that Guy through Spivak writes about literature and what I think is the value of kind of like reading literature together is that with literature, we're always in the realm of the unverifiable, right? But it's not only in literature that we're in the realm of the unverifiable. And I think to sort of engage in the kind of provisional work of knowledge production with one another in collaboration through practices of meaning making together, you know, um, it's important to recognize that, you know, that um, What is it? Once we recognize that we're in a realm of the unverifiable, right? We have to sort of come up with other means, other practices of of assigning authority, right? And I think it's I don't know. To me, I think it's a it's it's a it's a democratizing realization. I don't know. To me, this is like what's at stake in the humanities and humanistic interpretation, rather than scientific knowledge practices. Okay, uh, great, thank you. Um, so we would have like time for one or two more questions. Um, I don't know, Vanessa, do you have a question? Yes, uh, so basically my, my intervention is more a question comment uh, because I came from, I, I'm studying here, I'm doing a dissertation on um, corporate technology. So it's a field that is uh, uh, widely different from what you just um, exposed today. Yeah, but my background is in comparative law. I'm from Italy and I was born academically as a comparative. And the first shock that I had when I came to the US was that almost all the institutions in the US do not have a comparative law course. So that was my first cultural shock. And progressively, I think that I understand uh, a little bit why there is not such um I need to think comparative law because also comparative law in Europe has not solved the problems with methodology, the methodological problems and how to compare and how to establish differences and similarities. But thinking in terms of interdisciplinarity in law, uh, and I think that that's prominent, and my dissertation also focuses on this interdisciplinary approach, is that legal scholars um, purport to uh, design or create law that governs human behavior without an understanding of what is this human behavior. So that strikes me a little bit uh, because if, if uh, we just as legal scholars or professionals uh, are just trained into answering bar exam questions, then it's better to be substituted with a GPT because it's much more efficient. Instead, we are training legal scholars to have critical thinking and to approach different problems in law. Then I think that the curricula now is totally unsatisfied. From my perspective, I see much more um, courses that are devoted to um, succeeding at uh, writing uh, probably things that you wouldn't have 
the necessity to write if you have some A's external A's as, as the artificial intelligence, but less courses that uh, prone you to think in terms that um, where you can solve different problems in law. So I, I'm not sure if, if um, it's, an, uh, it's my discourse is uh, um, comprehensible. Um, but also, I think that the, uh, there is much more accentuation in the US of not look at comparative law, um, basically because there has not been a shock or uh, it has not collided with something that is external from the US system up until the European Union start regulating the internet. So I think that one of the uh, moments that comparativeness in general would need to reassess in uh, explaining why comparative law is important is because the effects of the internet and the effects of globalization cannot proceed from a much more holistic study of solving different problems that are cross-border problems. But just a comment. Uh, do, do you want to answer to that? Or? I don't know that I have an answer, but just in response to the very last piece of it, I mean, the thing that I think a lot about also is climate migration too, right? And there's a way in which the nation state form uh, has organized the way in which we think about our responsibilities towards others, right? Um, of course, in a kind of like very circumscribed way, but if in the next 50 years when we when so many people in the world will um before will be displaced right by the effects of climate migration and the only way we can think about it is through border enforcement <laughs> um you know the, like there there are many areas we can sort of identify i think where there are pressures there are going to be like new pressures um for us to sort of think right think in a more expansive way than um like a you know, the current kind of like parochial way in which we do legal education in the U.S. The U.S. can afford a certain parochialism given its wealth and its capacity for violence, I suppose. But it's not sustainable. I mean, it's just not tenable, right? It's not just that it's like ethically untenable. It's like practically untenable. Like our immigration re regime is untenable. Um, so maybe just like one last last comment from me. Uh, um, I found very interesting that you pointed out uh, several times. I think that you think there's an there's a good intention in, in doing comparativism by a lot of people basically to try to defamiliarize de the own system. And mm -hmm. I was a bit surprised because I feel like this is a too generous approach to a lot of comparative work. I feel like there are these people, um, especially um, perspectives from the global south. I feel have that much more but especially in in the main like the big european systems and in the us so big european i mean like germany like the hegemonic ones right germany france um i feel the tendency is still that there's a prevalent view of comparative law which says we have system a we have system b and then we just compare right because we're an objective uh, observer and then uh so we just to juxtaposition um it's also more a comment so i i i for, uh, for like I wish I uh, I'm not sure like I wish you were right with the assessment that this is the guiding impulse of a lot of comparativists but I'm not I don't feel like that's maybe the, the case for a lot of like still dominant work if you read the Oxford handbook of comparative law for example mm -hmm. no, no no I mean there is a Eurocentrism problem and then there is also you know like a kind of friendliness to the kind of inter-European exchange or you know there is a kind of ch you know chummy uncomfortable Eurocentric chumminess you know among, uh, among scholars who are kind of like concerned with that but then uh yeah I don't know again in comparative literature part of the story there is it sort of started as as um a field created by European refugees in the United States but then it became the place of really post-colonial thought right post-colonial thought and post-colonial critique which really did I mean all the humanities are in crisis now but it really did transform um humanistic scholarship in the in the in the American universities and it didn't happen in the in the U.S. and so it still has to happen and I do think like the young people who I'm teaching now very different from people I was teaching five years ago they're all socialists they're all interested in sort of thinking about um these you know these deep histories and also I think like 
have, there is an unprecedented willingness to really think a little bit more radically. Maybe a certain nihilism, a millennial nihilism, I don't know, I'm too old for to understand completely, but a millennial nihilism has tipped into something, you know, that feels urgent. <laughs> Um, so we just got a last uh, basic and short question in the chat. Um, do you aim to deconstruct the meta, meta narrative of law, for example, a legal discourse established by white people and the middle class by a comparative law approach? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not completely sure what you mean by meta narrative. And maybe, you know, my answer kind of like is an echo of a, the answer to a question I gave to you, Daniel, at some point. I mean, there is a Again, there's a risk within kind of critical theory that it starts to become intensely navel gazing. And rather than simply kind of limiting ourselves to the field of discourse, it's also, to me, relevant to think about the way in which this field of discourse touches the ground, right, and affects things on the ground. And maybe that's something singular about legal discourse and legal education. That's right. We're still concerned with like practical administration of ideas. Um, and so I think, you know, I don't think we always need a normative solution at the end of every legal paper, but I do think that a special thing that we have some privilege to do is sort of think a little bit practically also, right, about realizing some, some shared, shared ambitions. Great. Uh, thank you. So um, we're running out of time. Thank you so much for your, for your, um, for your speech on this, pro um, this discussion. Um, thank you everyone for attending. Before we let you go, if possible, uh, please turn turn on your, your camera for a moment so Simon can maybe take a picture mm -hmm. um, so we can um, post that. Yes, thank you very much, Daniel. And um, everyone, please uh, turn on your camera and I will take a quick photo for uh, everyone. All right, ready? Uh, one, two, three. Wait a second. I'm going to take um, another one. Uh, one, two, three. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. So um, our next session will be next week on April 7th. So we will continue our series on interdisciplinary approaches to comparative law with uh, Sarah Ross, who will speak about culture in the city, socio-legal methodologies, institutional ethnography, legal anthropology, and comparativism. Again, it was very nice to see you all today. Thank you for joining and I look forward to seeing you all during our next event. And thank you, Professor, for, for the talk. Goodbye. <laughs>